This is Talking With, Brian Lamb's conversation with historian Douglas Brinkley. Episode 2 starts after this. Out of your college history courses, you say that you got the opportunity to go to Georgetown. Was that in your mind when you were at Ohio State? Did you want to go to Georgetown? Um, Not necessarily, but I always had that as a reach school. You know, my game plan was to do undergrad at Ohio State and then perhaps get a law degree or go and do a doctorate in history. And I was constantly weighing those. For a brief amount of time, I wanted to be a folklorist. Uh, I loved folk history and folk music. I learned how to play the guitar. Um, when I was, you know, learning these old songs and stuff from like the Carl Sandburg songbook type of thing. And um, the, I also had a professor named Gary Richard who went on to be an administrator at, uh, in a, a great American historian who just taught America since 1945. And I just loved that class. I mean, it was right, you know, so up to date. And I learned that's sort of where with those uh, were my principal people. I, I got into French history a fair amount. And I just decided my big breakthrough, I guess what you're asking, is uh, the rise of somebody from Ohio. Um, I went to Europe. I went and spent a semester at Oxford, a semester abroad in England. How did you get to do that? Um, They had a program. All these universities have these semester abroad programs. And I thought, wow, I could go to Oxford for a semester. Went, and it was incredible. I stayed in the dorm there. We'd go to Stonehenge and, you know, Were you attached to one of the colleges? Um, I was at New College, uh, it was called there, um, at... um, at, at Oxford, and um, I found out the room I was in, Chris Christofferson had stayed there before, and that meant a lot to me. What did I, it, what does William, it mean? I got into William Blake then very heavily, the poet William Blake, and went to his grave and read all of his poetry, and then I started reading all of George Orwell, just just straight through, not not you know not his you know animal farm and and you know and the, but just all of them you know homage to catalonia and down and out in london and paris and uh, right. coming for, up for air for a second go back to the oxford thing for somebody that has never been to oxford has no idea what it looks like why is that so important i and mean what is it what did it look what, what's it like there well first off there was the scam element of it i mean oxford was marketeering its name to uh, rubes like myself in the midwest you know come you get to do a oxford some the buckeyes now at oxford university uh it's a way for them to generate revenue um i was smart enough street smart enough to pick that up the, 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 that's what was really going on but it worked for me because I met people from Italy and Spain that were my age, and I realized that they were fluent in languages and I wasn't. Um, but I did have an edge that I had somehow developed an ability to speed read, so I could read, whip through novels like you, you know, faster than people that spoke four languages. And I, I started realizing at Oxford that my ability to read. Um, was a, a, a skill set that I didn't realize I had. Uh, but then just seeing the historic sites and the churches and the storied history and going to Blenheim, Winston Churchill, or going, you know, um, you know, even recently I got moved being in the underground um, London where Churchill spent the war years. Uh, I really g- got into reading about Winston Churchill a great amount and also Mahatma Gandhi, at that period, you know, these are figures in world history and I wanted to know about. But I came back a little changed. I left Oxford, I got back to Columbus, and I realized that whole semester all my friends were still eat, ordering pizza, hanging around, you know, um, in a frat-like environment. And I, my, I, my mind was ablaze from my, my um, trip to Europe. Because after I was at Oxford, I then crossed over and spent time in France and um, uh, the Netherlands and Brussels. Did your buddies at Ohio State <clears throat> sense that you were changed? No, because I kept my humor as a consistent, you know, trying to be uh, um, humorous. But I got a little more serious. My uh, one roommate, Bart Jacoby, was a great football player in, um, in high school. He was an extraordinary athlete. And he would run every night a long ways. And they used to keep the lights on at the Ohio State Buckeye Stadium. So I kind of got back and wanted to get more in shape physically to not, not just drink beer and, you know, be a, be a 
uh, slug. And so I started running at night with him. I have great memories that we would go. He would run more than me. I, I was, I was, he was fast. But we would go out there and do miles. I'd do, you know, three miles, four miles in the evening. But something about the empty stadium at night, even like if it's like snow coming down, but the lights are on and nobody's on the track at night. And you're just, you know, a few people and you're just jogging around there. You'd come, I'd come back so energized and study late into the night. And I would go to a... The, I found that they kept the law library open late. So if I was a night owl, I could study from like midnight to three in the morning uh, at the law library, which was open. And I got to, uh, my most dis, most prominent memory of that is a, um, a night janitor, who um, uh, African-American gentleman who was a born-again Christian, and he would try to you know, talk to me about the New Testament, you know, and, and things. And uh, I befriended him and heard his stories about his life and things like that. Um, and then I'd, I'd try to sleep in a little bit, but I would, you know, meaning I'd go back to bed and not get up till 10. Did but, you ever get in trouble in Ohio State? I never got in trouble in any big way, you know. <laughs> uh, I mean, um, that's, no. Nah. You know, I was always pretty good. I was always, like, pushing the edge, but I always knew where the edge was. Did you um, go to class? I did. I, there were pros and cons, though. The classes, some of them were so big, if you don't show up, nobody knows you're there. It's not like, the, you know, so you're kind of on your own. And um, I tended to have certain classes I couldn't wait to, and some of the ones, like my physics class, I would conveniently miss and that's not if you're going to go to a big school you got to really be self motivated it's not like a small school where people are noticing your absence what class at ohio state left the biggest impression on you um gary richard's class us history since 1945 cuz i said i could do that now, I, go back you were in school in 1978 79 yeah so i started with my uh we started in the fall of 78 and so we're dealing with um you know, the big election while I was, um, well, we, we graduated, so we had the big election um, for me was 1980, you know, at college when Reagan beat Carter. And I remember very clearly Reagan being shot while I was in college at Ohio State and what a big deal and following all of that um, later. Did you have a reaction? Can you remember? Oh, it was just awful. The thought that, well, well you gun a president down and um, again, I, I liked the way Reagan used humor. You know, I forgot to duck, and uh, the way that he handled himself through all of that uh, um, was deeply admirable. But yeah, we, I was quite patriotic um, throughout. You know, we kept every morning. My mom and dad made me put a. If I didn't, my dad would. Um, but we put an American flag up on our lawn, uh, and that was just part of our my growing up. And my parents, by that point, had uh, turned from being for Jack Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, and even Humphrey in 68. By 72, they were for Nixon, and they stayed Republican ever since. Um, that 72 election turned them, and they loved Ronald Reagan. What changed their mind? Um, they didn't like the unrest in the streets, the protesting, um, but particularly by 72, the anti-war movement and the way, I think the the law and order aspect of what Nixon was doing appealed to them and McGovern seemed too far to the left. Um, and you did know, you, What did you think of McGovern when you were at uh, Ohio State? Um, I liked him, but I was looking, you know, I was good at talking to people. You, I didn't mean to interrupt. You wouldn't have been at Ohio State. I went to Ohio State. State. <clears throat> um, I was in high a, school. Yeah, I, you know, we try to stay out of politics somewhat in the high schools because the teacher did. I just was stunned that my parents made the kind of change. Like, how do you go from, um, because we're Catholic, John F. Kennedy was a big deal. I think I, when I write about Kennedy, I do deeply remember simply that my parents would cut him and Bobby Kennedy, a lot of slack because they were Catholic. That, like, we got a guy in the game. And I, and I, so I don't think it was exaggerated that Kennedy inspired Catholics that, uh, in the same way Barack Obama did for African Americans. Uh, um, and so. How Catholic were your parents? We would go to church every Sunday. 
uh, uh, St. Rose. Uh, I had to go, you know, I deeply avoided doing classes at the church. I did, but I did not like, um, you know, I thought I did enough by just doing, you know, going to mass, doing, going and um, doing, going to confession. It seemed to me enough on my billet. You know, they pushed it a little bit more. But uh, rosary beads and the Hail Mary and Our Father, and it stayed with me all my life. Uh, and the it may have ended up why my sister went to Notre Dame Catholic School, and I ended up coming to Georgetown Catholic School. And uh, and, and so, anyway, we, we incidentally, one other interesting thing at Ohio State. So I, when I'm telling you I'm wor- working, I liked working. I liked making money. I liked putting. I had the energy to work. And I got a great job my senior year as a waiter in the faculty club. Well, at 2 o'clock, we stopped serving lunch. And at about 1.58, every day, uh, Woody Hayes, the football coach, would come. And he'd eat by himself. And I'd be, hey, Coach Hayes. And I got to talk to him very um, directly and individually a lot. And he was a big Nixon supporter. And uh, I would talk to him about politics. And one day, I um, he saw me reading in a, a Norman Mailer's book, um, Armies of the Night, about protest at the Pentagon. And I was uh, uh, reading it, and he like called me over, and he just said, "What the hell are you reading that for?" I said, "It's in a, being assigned in a class. They're assigning Norman Mailer." <laughs> What class? He, and I told him, he was like writing it down. It's like, oh, God, am I getting this professor in trouble or something? He acted like I was reading the worst piece of subversive literature that's ever been written. And uh, and I said, well, are you really thinking? He said, no, you finish it if it's assigned. I'm not, you have to, but I'm just questioning, that not, I'm not questioning you reading it, because if you're assigned, read it. But I'm going to look into who's assigning this, and I left there like God. He's a, but Coach Hayes was a, actually a wonderful character to talk to about football, about life. He was very into the ROTC at Ohio State at that point, and was deeply involved with military history. So I would talk to him about war-related matters and U.S. history. Did you ever history. consider going in the military? I wish I did. But that's only in retrospect. I mean, you missed the 72 after that. You didn't have to go to the draft. I mean, and it became kind of, you know, it, the, the people that at that generation a lot that went in in my class were people that weren't going to, couldn't get into college or something. And I had college-educated parents, and they were directing us to college all along. But I could have used some of that discipline back then or a couple years of public service. I don't want to romanticize what that would have been like. Uh, um, but I find it a great career for young people uh, when I meet them. And I encourage people to go into Army and Navy, Air Force, Marines. Uh, they come out better people from that experience. And, and it's a really, you know, I don't want to be a recruitment officer for the military, but it's, um, I do feel I maybe missed out um, something. What I get gained was an understanding of all these sort of intellectual currents because of you know, working these bookstores and doing other things where I would, you know, start reading Kierkegaard or, you know, um, you know, all of Kafka. And I had time to kind of be an intellectual where I'm not sure I would have been able to do that in the military. How much do you retain on Kierkegaard and Kafka and <clears throat> all those philosophers, do you remember what they really oh, stood yeah, for? I do, but I, what I tend to do is I extract a few things from them that I can use in my life. Um, most of these writers, beyond being great writers, and you know, there's something that they're saying that uh, will come into mind and, and be important. Uh, I mentioned Norman Mailer, whose ego was so large, and I got to know Norman later in life. I wrote a profile about him for Rolling Stone called The Last Buccaneer. And then the, there was the great African-American novelist, Ralph Ellison. And they were at an Iowa Writers Workshop. Ellison, who wrote Invisible Man, and Mailer. And Ellison said, Norman, the problem with you is that you don't realize we're all dispensable. 
simple line by Ralph Ellison, but I think about it a lot. Like wherever I'm at, I know I'm dispensable. Like this, I you know, whether job, you know, like this is not. If I left tomorrow, somebody else fills the place. Uh, and it's just uh, hard when you want to, you know, to, to, it's important to keep that in mind because it keeps you grounded a little bit, not to get too high on your horse. Um, the Growing up in the Midwest, the one sin, Brian, I found, the thing that I can't tolerate, I have one intolerance of human behavior, obviously more than one, but the one, I just don't like people that are conceited, like that have the disease of conceit that they feel they're so much better than the next person. And uh, when I came east, I encountered that a lot. I didn't encounter that in the Midwest. Can you remember, I know this might be hard, somebody that is conceited that hit you uh, in your life and you said, I don't like that. Oh, I, oh so many. And I don't want to, uh, it may not be fair to single out one, but uh, I caught it um, a lot when I got to Georgetown and more when I was in New York. Um, there became a feeling that if you didn't go to an Ivy League school, that you were lesser. I did not realize that that would be something when I'm, I'm, I was so proud of going to Ohio State. But you, there would be people that I would meet that all they would do is say, well, I got into Princeton. I went to Princeton. I'm the Princeton. You know, and I, I, they would, it, it was an attitude. And I thought, boy, is this the best and the brightest of the Ivy League that they, somewhere through all that education, they didn't learn to not be conceited. And, and, uh, um, and so... Did it make a difference that they had gone to Princeton and Yale or Harvard or any of these schools? I think they... I grew up slower in the Midwest, and I may have been paying for it ever since. Um, but, you know, so they were... Many who got to go to good private schools, I went to public schools, they got the advantage of a great prep school of Trinity in New York, and then they go to Yale or something. So, yeah, they have a big leg up. Because after I did my doctorate at Georgetown, even Georgetown wasn't good enough when you applied for jobs in history. They want to hire the people that did a PhD from Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Um, you know, sometimes a, a Berkeley, Stanford slips in. But um, so I've been a, all that is to say I've been a big booster of the land grant schools like Ohio State. I think they're great places. Purdue where you went, you know, University of Michigan, Minnesota. Um, you know, I like a lot of those, all of them. I was recently at University of Arkansas, Fayetteville, great place. Um, because families can afford it, and you don't, people grow at a, a different age. I mean, I was 17 when I was going to college growing up in rural Ohio. I didn't really have the tools to prepare for, you know, to go to Yale. You've got to, like, be driven for that or have contacts or, you know. Have you ever seen, since you've become a professional and you're in public forums and all that, somebody discriminate against you because of Ohio State, Georgetown versus the Ivy Leagues? I think so on any time. Oh, yes. Any time you do a job at a top market school, they look a little bit down, even at Georgetown, compared to Princeton, Harvard, and Yale. You know, it's just the way it is. I mean, it's uh, there. There is an elitism. You compensate um, in any way for that? Work. I outwork people, and uh, I have a work ethic. And and by the time I just keep a kind of put my head down and go straight ahead. Um, I've you know it's in and you compensate for it in just different ways. My first book. I wrote on Dean Acheson, um, and I got published by Yale University Press. So, you know, you're, like, now connected because you did a book with that particular press. But Hold when it. I first came to D.C., it startled me that the encounter elitism writ, writ large, not at Georgetown, but just in the milieu of, uh, of the East Coast. Go back to the Dean Acheson book. How did you get Yale to publish your book? Um, I, um, well, that's a good story. So I came to Georgetown, and I started doing my master's, and I got a fellowship. So the I, I then worked the used bookstores of D.C. I was the uh, night manager of Second Story Books on P Street in Georgetown, 
Then I would moonlight at the second story at DuPont Circle. And then later I'd be night manager at Idle Times Books and Adams Morgan. All of these have great stories to them because I got to become friends with Christopher Hitchens, who would I know you knew very well, and he would come in bringing books that I would buy from him. I got to talk to him. We, we were bonded for life um, by the used bookstores here. James Foreman, one of the great civil rights leaders I became friendly with, uh, he would come and, um, and clean out our Af- uh, Africa and black American sections in the bookstores stacked up. I'd ring him up and I'd talk to him about the books and all. And Were pe- you working them? <laughs> yeah, I was working them. I, I would ask them all, just like you're asking me, I would ask them everything about their life. Ralph Nader coming in or Barry Commoner, people I knew and heard about or suddenly in the bookstore. Because there's an intimacy at a bookstore at night that, you know, you're coming in at like nine at night on a snowy night and they're only like, a, there's a, the cat we're feeding in the store, jazz music and two people. You know, one of them is somebody like James Foreman. I would I would talk to them and... and not in a way that they was in a way that was engaging for them you know i'm smiling because the producer of this show nick ravel uh worked in a bookstore here in this town and had some of the same experiences i'm sure we should get him out here and make him we have to should. talk about it well larry mcmurtry the great novelist uh, had booked up in there was a bo- used rare book community and i was part of it at georgetown but I, my professor was Dr. Jules Davids, and Davids helped write John F. Kennedy's Profiles and Courage with Ted Sorensen. How did he help? Um, research, t- chapter drafting. If you read like Herbert Parmet's biographies of Kennedy, some people think Dave, uh, Jules Davids actually wrote hunks of it, of the book. Did you ever talk to him about it? I did. He was. Um, he did. He told me how much he helped. He was proud of it. Um, and he, Jackie Kennedy came to take a class of history with him, and uh, he was a very, very um, wonderful man. But I found out then he had Alzheimer's, and they asked me. He needed to do tests and have a semester off, and I was a pretty young graduate student. They asked me to take over his course. He did. So here I was, let's say 22, 3 maybe. What uh, year would that have been? I'm probably around 84 I did this, 85, uh, I'm trying to remember. But it, I took over his course, and um, I taught U.S. diplomatic history at Georgetown that young because they were. he got ill right before the classes started. And they were either going to have to hire an adjunct and change it around or let me be like the teacher's assistant. And, and even though I would then, he would supervise me kind of thing. Through Jules Davids, I got, he gave me an introduction to Pamela Harriman, uh, who was married to the great Governor Averill Harriman and lived in Georgetown. And they wanted me to read to Governor Harriman. Uh, so I would go. He, he Why? Because he had gone near deaf, but um, wasn't deaf. If they had a machine for hearing, you know, he had a lot of money, Harriman, so it was the best hearing device money could buy at that time. But I had a pretty clear voice and spoke directly, so I would, you know, the, the, the task was to read like, Hi, Governor. Uh, this is in the op-ed piece of the New York Times today, written by Russell Baker. And then I would read out loud uh, an article like that, and, and he would hear it. And um, it, it, was, it was interesting. He was, you know, and again, at, when I got a moment to ask him about Stalin and Russia <laughs> and all, I did. How long and, did you and, do this? Um, well, I did it for a spell, and then he got went to, I believe it was... Um, Bermuda and broke both of his legs in the ocean. A wave hit him, hmm. and um, he then got, uh, you know, he was in in decline. And then at that point, but through this world of Harriman uh, was Alice Atchison, the widow of Dean Atchison, and I found out uh, she had me meet David Atchison, the son of Dean Atchison, and they were opening Atchison's papers at Yale, and. Atchison was a great writer. He's Secretary of State for Harry S. Truman, most famously, but was a brilliant legal mind and writer and had wit. And and so his papers openings were a big deal. 
I arrived the day they opened the papers and there was only one other person in line and two of us started looking at them. So I had great material for my first book because then whatever I did, anything I was quoting was the first time somebody ever heard Atchison on Brandeis or Atchison on Felix Frankfurt or Atchison on Archibald MacLeish. At the very least, it was fresh material. Who cared at the time? Um, that I was doing that? Not that you were doing it so much that, that you, people were going to get to hear what Atchison thought. How, inter- how much interest was there? He was getting, there was interest because Truman had already hit his renaissance. I mean, uh, people, he, once Truman did plain speaking, and uh, a man, um, Donovan, wrote a two-volume biography of Truman. Uh, Truman was starting when I, at that era of, let's say, call it the early 80s, had gone through a full bore the America loved Harry Truman. And Atchison was now starting to be seen as the architect of the Cold War. Uh, Atchison won the Pulitzer Prize for his memoir, um, Present at the Creation. So George Kennan and Dean Atchison were in the mix. Later, while I was working on my book, uh, Walter Isaacson and Evan Thomas wrote their book, The Wise Men which was the, was the joint story of Avril Harriman, Dean Acheson, Robert Lovett, um, John J. McCloy, uh, Chip Bolin, and George Kennan. And it's a group portrait. And I was worried, like, uh-oh, maybe they got into my, you know, they, and, and they hadn't. So it was actually a useful tool. And Quince, his life has it, my Dean Acheson book got reviewed by Evan Thomas for the New York Times very favorably. Was that a dissertation you were doing? It was at my Georgia? PhD dissertation at Georgetown on two volumes I did. It was very long. And, um, and then I got a, I, a, there was a professor at Yale named Gaddis um, Smith, and he had written a volume on Acheson, a book once. And I, talked to him, and he said, why don't you submit your work to Yale University Press? So on my own, I wrote a letter, sent them, and they do peer review, get collect letters, and Yale decided to publish it, and I was just ecstatic. And um, and then getting reviewed by Evan Thomas and the New, um, the New Republic and New York Review of Books and all of that was heady stuff, and I felt I did the right thing. I t- tell students today... Um, do your dissertation that can get published. Do something, you know, this is your shot to get a job. I mean, so make sure you're getting a book, you know, and biography, which is frowned upon by some scholars. It's actually, university presses like it a lot if you do a Life and Times. Douglas Brinkley is an American historian and author. You can listen to more interviews with him by searching his name in the video library at cspan.org.